Joseph Campbell calls the foundation of our Western culture, the wellspring and greatest treasure for literary creativity that writers can mine is in mythology. That's where we all have risen up from, is mythology. There are particular styles of narrative using rhyme and strong metrical cadence with nature as a backdrop, plums the deep well question of, of who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? If anyone can answer that painting and who painted it, we'll get an anthology for me tonight from California Press and Schools. Also, one of the most important questions, what are we doing here? Questions we try to answer on the exciting trip of self-examination while we discover what is going on in this crazy world we call life. And how do we live a life with ethical, moral, and spiritual value to it? What gives us meaning? That's what these people here tell us about. These are the kind of storytellers we call seers, druids, bards, skalds, troubadours, to a certain extent, and minstrels. Those whose function was to celebrate the heroes, victories, or laws of a nation. A poetry that is social in function, related to life, tradition, and the ideals of community. The other famous writers who have used this style were William Wordsworth, John Hart Neihart, who wrote the great American epic of the settling of the American West called The Cycle of the West. Everyone should really read that. It's an incredible, incredible book. There's five uh, stories to it. Uh, written in blank verse. And Federico Garcia Lorca's The Gypsy Ballads of Garcia Lorca. Another great uh, book. So, um, with that, we jump into our first reader, Sam Mills. He's kind of a relative newcomer. He got into uh, the poetry and bug, and then all of a sudden he hit him. I guess he's been writing for some time. But anyway, he's been up here for a couple of years now. He has two shiny new books for us. Young adult novels published by Steiner Books. The Demon Slayer, a coming-of-age story set in ancient India involving the Hindu god Rama Vishnu, the preserver from the classic mythology of India, and the Firebringer, using classical Greek mythology with Prometheus, which means foresight. Very important to have foresight. Everyone's got great hindsight, but foresight. The Titan who stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. Zeus was mad and punished Prometheus by chaining him to a rock, and each day a vulture would tear away at his liver. But at night, the liver would regrow and heal itself for the next tearing the next day. But I'll let Sam fill in all the other uh, details of all this, so please welcome Sam Mills. Chris and Todd and Julie, the four pillars of this organization, for inviting me to be a reader, especially when I don't even consider myself to be a poet. I think I'm a novelist. At least I have been for the last 10 years. And I've cranked out uh, five novels in that time. And finally this summer I got a couple published, which was lucky. Um, one of my copy editors, uh, was at a social venture uh, network conference and ran into Gene Golligy, the publisher of Steiner Books, and said, hey, Gene, I'm doing some work for this guy who writes these great novels, la, la, la. He said, have him send me a couple of chapters and a synopsis. So I sent uh, four different stories out to him, and I didn't hear anything for weeks and weeks. And But, you know, usually when you send stuff like that, you don't hear anything anyway. Sometimes you, you get the dear, you know, sorry, but no thanks. But usually, a lot of times, you don't get anything. Then the phone rang one day, and it says, Hey, Sam, this is Gene Golligy from Stein Books. Hey, man, I love your stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, you know, about a year and a half later, I, I'm, I, I came out with two published books. Uh, so I'm going to start with The Firebringer, uh, which is about Prometheus. And uh, it's based on Greek mythology. Uh, and it's a coming-of-age tale, and it's considered a young adult book, and it's targeted for 12 and up. And that's why Steiner's good, because Steiner 
publishes the education catalog for Waldorf schools, and this is going to be featured in the catalog next month. So hopefully it will help kick it into their curriculum a little bit. Um, the Firebringer is, uh, what I want to do is give you a brief synopsis of the story, and then I'll read a, a, a passage from it. Uh, Prometheus has been let off the rock. Heracles shot the eagle and then freed him. And then because Heracles was Zeus's favorite son, Zeus bargained and worked out a deal with Prometheus and let him have his freedom as long as he wore a ring that had a piece of the rock and a piece of the chain that had bound him to, to the rock for 30,000 years. His liver was eaten out every day for 30,000 years, and he did not give in to tyranny. So, but he, he agreed to wear the ring because he saw it as his, his uh, symbol of standing up to tyranny. Anyway, so when he got off the rock, I decided that he started a school outside of Athens in Actia. And um, it's a small school, it was sustainable, and he'd been running it for hundreds of years, and some of the greatest minds went through that school. But uh, Hermes, messenger of the gods, and Zeus's favorite son, because he, you know, he follows the program, uh, he was down spying on Prometheus in this silly little school, and he noticed Chastia, who was the oldest female student, and she was beautiful. So he goes up to Zeus and he says, hey dad, you should check her out. And Zeus says, you know, you're always my, my favorite son. And Zeus is bored. It's been a long time since he's had any action at all of that kind. And uh, he figured maybe it's time to seed another hero. So he went, he turned himself into a big, big white eagle, flew down to Actia, saw Demetrios and uh, Chastia. Demetrios is the oldest male student there, and he's about to graduate, and he's going to start a another school in, in, in Milos. But they're having a picnic, so Zeus flies down and lands on top of the tree on, uh, above where they're having their picnic, and he's being bothered by these finches, but he listens in and he scopes her out. After he's seen enough, he flies back up to Mount Olympus, and that's where we pick him up. Oh, I need my glasses. Okay. Moments later, Zeus materialized on his patio. A semicircle of majestic columns circled endlessly into the heavens, as if to suggest that they and not Atlas supported the universe. As he pulled a few feathers out of his mouth, the remains of a careless finch that had flown too close, he mulled over all he had learned. He had to agree with Hermes. The beautiful girl was indeed a delicate creature. Her combination of purity and grace, girlish innocence, loveliness, and refined intelligence made her an ideal blend of all the great goddesses. She had Aphrodite's beauty, Hera's stature, Athena's intelligence, and Artemis's natural playfulness and grace. Zeus was already enchanted by her. But first, he had to figure out a way to meet and capture her without Prometheus or her young boyfriend, Demetrios, being able to prevent him. He decided he would sidestep the old schoolmaster and eliminate the young suitor altogether. As long as Demetrios was around, he would be too distracted she would be too distracted to be easily seduced by him. And he wanted to woo her romantically and make her fall in love with him. This would not be like the brief, intense encounter he had had with Leda, the Queen of Sparta. He had fallen for Leda while watching her playing with her children on the grounds of her palace. Her long, curly red hair cascaded down her lovely back and highlighted her smooth, rounded shoulders and long, graceful neck. Later that night, when her husband, King Tindorus, was busy with affairs of state, 
Zeus swooped down in, in, disguised as a great white swan while the Spartan queen bathed in a private pool outside her bedroom chamber. It was one of his fondest moments. He grabbed her long, elegant neck with his tender beak and held her firmly in place with the aid of his strong, encompassing wings, which he cleverly wrapped around her to shield her from unwelcome eyes. Later, Leda produced a great white egg that hatched the very same Helen whose beauty would one day launch an armada of 1,000 Greek warships and would eventually cause the ruin of Troy. With Chastia, his courtship would be different. He would stand before her in moderated glory, lest he toasted her cinder by revealing his full, the full power of his majesty and let natural selection work its magic. Suddenly, he sensed a familiar presence behind him and turned to see Hera standing at the entrance to his great patio. She eyed him with her usual suspicion. I felt you met at the station just now, husband, and wondered where you were. Whenever any of the gods materialized themselves, a subtle vibration sent waves through the surrounding atmosphere. Even the dullest of them could sense it, and Hera was anything but dull. Her voice had a familiar edge to it that he had heard a thousand times before. I was soaring as an eagle over Athens, my love, surveying my kingdom and getting some exercise at the same time. I spied several new houses rising on the western side of town. Those humans propagate like rats, don't they? You would know all about that, wouldn't you? Her voice was frosty. But I really dropped by to ask you a favor, my love. She softened noticeably. Hesphestus is unhappy with his new Roman name and is threatening to boycott the celebration. I'm trying to convince him otherwise, but he remains stubborn and unyielding. Would you have a chat with him and persuade him to change his mind? I do want him to attend the party with the rest of the family. Just as an aside, Harris is a huge party. Uh, it's the hottest ticket in Olympus. And it's the name changing celebration where they're going to change their names from Greek to Roman to keep pace with the, the changing world below them. Zeus smiled, smiled wearily at his wife. Of course I will, my sweet. What's the matter with this new name? I think Vulcan fits him perfectly. Yes, I do too, Hera agreed, but he feels it sounds too much like vulture and resents the implication. Isn't that silly? I've already talked to Aphrodite, and she has agreed to help us change her husband's mind, but she is also unhappy with her new name. She said Venus is too close to venereal and is offended with the association. I hope she doesn't decide to boycott the party. I'll talk to both of them and encourage them to come. Zeus reassured her. I'll tell them it's going to be an important night and they should be witness to it. Hera smiled graciously. Thank you, dear. Please let me know how it goes. With long, elegant strides, she disappeared down the pathway that led to her separate dwelling. Zeus sensed that he best pursues Chastia with stealth and caution. Hera was already suspicious. He hated the way his wife could read him like an open book. Whenever he started sniffing around a new prospect, she was on him like a stinger on a bee. He would have to tread carefully, or he might subject himself, or more likely, poor little Chastia, to some painful consequences. But first things first, if he was to have any chance at all with the lovely maiden, he must figure out how to remove her handsome young boyfriend from the field of play for good. Thanks. So that's the fire burner. Now we're going to move to India, uh, to the demon slayer. And I'm just going to read the excerpt on the back of the book to give you a synopsis of the story. And then I've got a couple passages I'm going to bring, uh, read from that. 
Experience Hindu mythology through the art of storytelling. Learn what it means to live a dharmic life true to your word and respectful of your obligations and duties. In this coming of age tale, journey 5,000 years back to the danger-filled jungles of ancient India to a time when gods and demons walked on the earth. Abhe, the hunter's son, must earn his manhood by facing a selfish bully, a man-eating leopard, and a fierce demon. Daida, the loveliest maiden in the village, must marry according to the rigid laws of her society rather than her heart's choice. Pippin, the devout and peaceful woodcutter's son, must decide whether to follow his father's life path or become a sevic, a servant of the gods. The fate of each of these friends takes a sharp turn when Rama, Sita, and Lakshmana, banished royalty, arrive at their village. Okay, so we're going to pick up the story early on. Uh, a young girl, Leela, has disappeared, and the hunter, Abe's father, went out and uh, searched the jungle and found her remains and brought her back, and she had been devoured by a rogue leopard. So he's out now in search of the leopard. Meanwhile, Abhe has gone, is just going to the little archery range that he and his father set up to practice his uh, archery skills before he has to go out and collect peacock feathers to make more arrows. After gathering his gear, Abhe retreated to a secluded archery range that he and his father had created, safely tucked away from any adjoining structures. Daily target practice was a necessary ritual for the village hunters, as the others depended on their accuracy and skill for much of the meat and hides that helped to sustain their collective existence. He and his father had cleared out an area of brush and painted a white circle on the trunk of a large teak tree. The circle had a diameter that measured the same length as Ajay's arm. Then they marked three different release points, 20 paces, then 30 paces, and finally 40 paces from their target by driving white stakes into the ground. First, Abe stood at the closest point and fired all 20 arrows from his quiver. His missiles easily found the inside of the circle. He walked up to the tree and plucked them out and returned to the next marker 10 paces further away from the target area. Just when he was about to release his first arrow, he heard the sound of snapping twigs to his left. He turned to see Daida emerge from the trees nearby. She smiled at him bashfully. His breath caught in his throat at the sight of her beautiful face. I'm sorry, Abhe, did I startle you? The young girl asked as she stepped out into the open. He relaxed the tension of his bowstring and turned toward her. No, I could hear your footsteps approaching me, Daida. He pointed his bow and arrow toward the ground. Are you lost in the woods? He was teasing, for she had come to the range many times before as they used to play here when they were younger and were allowed more freedom to interact with each other. Now that they both approached adulthood, they were supposed to be chaperoned at all times, especially since her mother, Trusha, distrusted him. Actually, I'm picking flowers for Leela's funeral. She carried a basket with a few flowers already in it. How's your aim? Good. Watch, I'll show you. But you'll need to step back a few paces just to be safe. Daida stepped back, and Ave took aim, and loosed all 20 arrows into the white circle with a steady and uninterrupt, uninterrupted rhythm, as if he were a warrior in the heat of battle. She clapped with delight while he walked back to the tree to retrieve them, trying to contain his flushing pride. Can I try? She smiled at him, showing off perfect, a perfect, her perfect set of teeth, which gleamed like the white petals of a lotus blossom. How could he refuse? He looked around the area to make sure there were no unwelcome eyes spying on them, 
and then told her to place her basket at the base of the tree and to follow him back to the first mark. Once there, he handed his bow to her and instructed her to pull it back as far as she could. She managed to draw it about two-thirds of the way back. That should be enough, he determined. May I help you set the arrow? Yes, you may, she replied sweetly. Abe stood behind her. He could have sworn his heart leapt a few feet out of his chest as he swung his right arm around her and gently laid an arrow on the bone notch that was glued to the shaft of his bow. He slowly placed his other hand over hers along the shaft. Her body fit tightly against his, like it was formed from the same mold. He thought he could feel her heart banging like a hammer against her back, trying to break out, but then realized it was his own heart, beating like a framed back drum inside of him. Taking a deep breath, he removed his right hand from the arrow's notch after it was secured against the bow's sinewed string and positioned it over her right hand, placing his fingers alongside of hers. They cautiously pulled back the bow's taut string together. When it reached the level of her cheek, he adjusted the direction of the shaft and whispered for her to let it go. She released his he released his fingers at the same moment. The arrow streaked through the air and struck firmly into the center of the white circle. They stood in silence and stared at the arrow's shaft as it quivered for an instant and then grew still. A sense of shared magic permeated the space around them as if an, an eternal connection had been forged at that very moment in time. Then the twin sensation evaporated like a puff of smoke and was gone. Nice shot, Taida, he whispered in her ear. She waited a moment, for she was reluctant to spoil the experience with words, and then responded in her own equally hushed voice. Yes, nice shot, Abe. He dropped his arms, holding on to the bow, and freed her from the containment of his stance. She turned around and looked directly into his eyes. Abe felt as if a bolt of lightning penetrated his consciousness, numbing him and leaving him helpless before her. She was so beautiful, so present and alive. He knew he would love her forevermore. Obviously moved too, a tear glazed the corner of her right eye. She quickly averted her gaze and stared down at her feet. I must go and collect more flowers. Thank you for helping me experience the power of your bow. You're welcome. It was all he could think of to say. She walked back to the tree and picked up her basket. She glanced at the arrow shaft one last time, turned and smiled at him, and then disappeared into the trees and was gone. The question is, will they end up together? Unfortunately, she's been betrothed to Vishal, the town bully, whose father is the steward to the Hemish, the sage, and to the ashram, and has more status. And since Trusha, the mother, is the village matchmaker, Daida has no choice at all. Um, I'm going to read one more short passage. It's about the baddies, the demons. And you're going to meet them just as the reader does. Many, le uh, many leagues to the north of Abhe's village, Two demons crouched under the sweeping branches of a large cripple tree and picked at the remains of a human child. They had just kidnapped the young boy from a nearby village that had joined an ashram on the banks of the, Ma the Namada River. They both agreed that the little fellow made a tasty and delicious treat. Even though the soft meat had long since been devoured, they still gnawed on the child's bones for a Rakshasha's hunger is hard to crunch. Hanshira, the larger of the two demons, picked at some stubborn pieces of sinew with the two-inch claw of his right forefinger. The stubborn grizzle had lodged between his sharp and pointed fangs. Yes, he made a tasty little morsel indeed, nice and sweet, 
he observed. But I'm thinking a wild hog might be fitting for our next course. I spotted a pig's trail a little way back and think we could run it down in no time at all. What say you, brother? Are you game? Dorapa, a tall and lanky demon, belched contentedly before he responded to his older brother's suggestion. Your stomach is an endless pit, Hinshira, and is forever calling for more. I need to rest a spell before I can resume the hunt. I'm full enough with this man-child's flesh and guts and want to savor the flavor of this scrumptious meal. I was particularly partial to his liver, very delicate and tasty. Yes, yes, of course, you're right, little brother. I only meant as a follow-up for later, after we've digested a while, the older demon replied, sounding more disappointed than his words would suggest. They settled on, down on their haunches, leaning against the trunk of the giant tree. Thick, heart-shaped leaves provided a pleasant shade from the midday sun. They both had long, hairy arms and carried broad, curving sores which they tucked into the cloth sashes that were tied around their waists. Hanshira was notably broader in build than his younger sibling. They gnawed on the few remaining bones of the human boy child and listened to the distant trumpeting of a herd of jungle elephants downriver from where they lounged. A lot that goes on in the Demon Slayer. Um, you know, you want to know: Do Abhe and Daida end up together? Uh, can Abhe survive not only the bully but the leopard and then the demon? Um, what happens when Rama and Lakshmana and Sita arrive, and how do they become mentors to Daida and Bipin and uh, Abhe? Uh, also, within the story, there's about five different Hindu myths that are recounted or told as part of the story. Anyway, I'm going to finish up with a ballad. Um, and uh, this was written when my girl was 10 years old. She's now 21. Uh, but uh, it inspired this, this story, which is called The Golden Aspen Leaf. On a pale day, when the world was young, a girl decided to have fun by sneaking out the village gate when it was getting fairly late. Her elders told her to beware the dangers lurking outside there, to never stray beyond the wall or venture further than their calls. But she was restless, young, and bold, and they were wrinkled, gray, and old. She knew the village inside out, and now she sought to run about outside the walls a little while, for she was an impetuous child. So she skipped along the forest path, looking for butterflies to catch. A golden beauty fluttered by and caught the girl's excited eye. She watched it fly into the woods and followed it as best she could. One step behind it, all the way, it teased with her as if to play leading her deep into the trees, where it grew dank and hard to see. At last, the girl came to a halt. Tall trees encircled like a vault. Then fear reached in and seized her heart, for it was fast becoming dark. The butterfly also grew still, and with a golden light it filled, expanding both with light and size, forcing the girl to shield her eyes. And when she opened them again, before her stood a fair maiden, who seemed both young and old at once. The forest glowed with her presence. She smiled gently at the girl, whose fearful heart had once unfurled. <laughs> The maiden offered her her hand and led her to a lovely stand of golden aspens in a row with myriad sparkling leaves aglow. They settled themselves on the ground, 
with spectral lanterns all around. And then the maiden sang to her a soothing song of other worlds. Her voice was silken, sweet, and soft. The girl no longer felt so lost. And when the maiden's song was through, she spoke of many truths she knew of how the worlds were intertwined, that light and dark were both combined, and how they then were both the same, and from a sacred source they came. The maiden ended with these words. This is your lesson to be heard. I am your higher self, my dear. Close to your heart, I'm always near, supporting your adventure here. You only have your doubts to fear. Be bold, have faith, and persevere. And then she brightened like the sun, and sound and sense became as one. When normal space returned at last, it seemed as if no time had passed. The girl was sitting near the gate inside the walls she'd grown to hate. She thought she ventured out of town, but now she sat on village ground. She knew someone had touched her heart, and that she'd seen light in the dark. She wondered if she'd had a dream of butterflies and gold light beams. But when she opened up her hand, the girl began to understand. A golden aspen leaf she held. And she remembered all was well. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Richard Gill. I first heard Richard uh, Gill on one of my first visits to Nevada City somewhere around 1980-1983 in his Traveling Medicine Man shows, complete with a horse-drawn wagon and tonics. He convinced me there that here was the place to be. Any community that supported a traveling medicine man was a place for me. <laughs> so Richard's got a multimedia spoken word presentation, a CD of it all to take home with you for a very small fee. Remember, support your local poets. It's good medicine. Similar to the theater production with sculpture and music, word wizardry, mystical revelations, incantations, and sparkling imagery as tools of the trade to entertain and provoke our minds and hearts to what really matters in our lives. We also have Gianna Rome, who's going to be providing a musical accompaniment. So please welcome Richard Gill. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment and tell you that I created Signs of Our Time as an artistic statement because I've had many thoughts and questions about our world at this time. So as an artist, I have combined several of my art forms into one. The poetry to produce the story, the spoken word to present the story, and the, the sculpture to give you a lasting image, and with Mr. Johnny Rome's music to create an overall feeling. And it is my hope the signs of our time will give my audience something just a little bit different to think about. It may be time to look for the signs. The signs of our time. 
Where did it start? How will it end? Where are we coming from? How many have it all? And how many more have none? Could this be a sign of our time? It seems within a century or so we have come so far from the plodding horse and buggy to the fastest one. Train, planes, rockets to the moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Could this be a sign of our time? What did it take to get this far? Have you stopped to think it through? Oh, you don't have to stop. You don't even have to think. That's what computers do. Is this a sign of our time? We drill the ocean bottom with the fishes and the fowl. We drill some, we spill some, we kill some. We put it in bank, take to the bank, clean up the mess and leave the rest. Raise the gas, get the cash. One big laugh. Is this what people do? They take the best? Screw you? Or is this just a sign of our time? Factories turn out luxuries for the masses to enjoy. Of course, we kill the trees, pollute the seas, we foul the air. Does anyone care? We outsource jobs for lower bids to countries where they work the kids. It's not funny. Is this a sign of our time? Corporate greed trickles down and spreads throughout the land. Well, he got his, and I'm gonna get mine any way I can. Downside to crime, rising welfare, cheating, healthcare, cleaning, cut the school, raise the pool. Could this be a sign of our time? Could this be a sign of our time? The doubt flows up, and the doubt flows down. As that, it takes a dime. Because we got people running, because Jesus is coming. Those simple folks are smoking their dope, they're looking for hope. They praise the Pope, they join the cause, it's not your fault. Opinion polls and mind control, fill the jails and kill the males. Leave the dummy and make the money, you want some more? Start a war. Is this a sign of our time? Now I've heard it said. The end is nigh with apocalyptic rain. Well, who's going to write our history books? When it's time to turn the page. Well, the hour is always the darkest. Before the dawn appears, what is not of love, it's bound to be fear. So let your rafters ring with laughter. Let music fill the air. Think love. Love thyself. Respect thy neighbor. Care, share, just be fair. Follow your heart. Make a new start. Believe. Oh, it will be there. But keep in mind to look for the signs. The signs of our time.
There's a virus spreading. And it's creeping across our lands. Lurking on the city streets and byways. Women. Men. Even little children. They're the homeless. Young and old. Huddled around a burning trash can. Huddled from the cold. Oh, we may not give much thought to those strangers in the night seeking to warm their souls from the chill of their plight. But always keep in mind that round this fire's roar Loyal to the company. 
always eager to lend a hand. Still they fired him with just one year to go while they hired a younger man. Knowing his wife contracted cancer and she died two years to the day. He used up most of his savings. Insurance wouldn't pay. He signed over his house to his children in case his health should take a turn to have a loving place to live. He came his baby He broke his hip in May. Two fractures to the bone. He ended up on welfare in the Seedy Valley nursing home. All the attendants were kind, but overworked. So his time was spent staring at the floor. Old friends? Oh, they must be gone now. And his kids? They seldom miss you anymore. Are these the golden years that he dreamed of once upon a time? Now he can't even contemplate dying. The drugs have dimmed his mind. This is the story of old Frank Billings, caught up in the chaos of our time. We're sorry for you. Oh. In many forms, the elusive, ever-changing, truth. What is your truth? Webster says, Truth is conformity with a verified fact of reality. Well, what is real? What is fact? There was a time the world was flat. That was that. A common fact. But to our surprise, we suddenly found the world is round. Now the laws apply and you can't deny that in the sky man can't fly. Oh, can't you see? It just can't be. It's a reality. Then all too soon, we're on the moon. Where is the truth? Now there's a belief that's held by all and from our souls. We heed a call of something bigger, greater, they say. And to this unseen force, we pray. Though many differ in their quest, each one is righteous from the rest. And so we battle, kill, and maim. Well, our beliefs are much the same. Who has the truth? Prophet's words are true, clear. Love. Love my neighbor. Have no fear. Yet man interprets for his greed. 
and many follow in their need. And so we kneel, we sing and pay, waiting for that judgment day. We close our eyes, turn our backs, refuse to see, ignore the facts as chaos threatens. Is that the truth? about every man or woman who has ever been lost in a battle and every family that has been made to suffer that loss. This is about victory. Every victory ever won. Time for the reading of the last will and testament of a dying generation. I bequeath my sons and daughters this earth is not a and to your children and to theirs waiting to be born. I give to you these plans of plenty with my greedy upturned hand. Oh, I got mine! Now you get you any way you can. Why, I show you the face of war and the way of arms to bear. I've allowed you to view the plight of your brothers and I've taught you not to care. Oh, you've seen our path of progress. We live but for today. Now you must dwell beneath the 
shadow of our doomsday folly. We danced. Now you must pay. Yet this family still can reunite if we pull all our sets. Be sure to keep an eye on the crazies of this world because the fortune is all but spent. Myself, 